I just think it's kind of fun to talk about it because I did a little bit of research on it. We start with a yellow crystal. By shining, I believe, UV light on it, it gradually becomes purple. Okay. If we remove the UV light, it gradually returns back to the yellow. So this would seem to suggest that this is a reversible process. We provided the energy, we saw a change, we removed that energy, and it goes back. That sounds reversible, that sounds physical. When you actually probe what's happening on a molecular level, you're changing chemical bonds. Okay. So the chemical and physical property difference, or th chemical and physical changes as a different category, is a very challenging category to deal with because there are some cases that you just aren't going to be able to see. You have to use your best instinct behind it. Sometimes that sucks. Okay? So mixing red food dye with white cake frosting is chemical or physical? So if we mix red food dye with white cake frosting, okay, which we talked about on Thursday, if we walk through that, okay, what did we say on Thursday about that one? It's physical. It's physical. And probably the more interesting one is, I think somebody actually said it with an R. It's reversible. It's reversible. You can reverse the mixing of red food dye into cake frosting. Okay. It is not easy because of the process in which you stirred in that cake frosting. You can't, you can't replicate the reverse process perfectly. Why not? Because you're a human. If you program a machine to do it, the machine can actually reverse the process. Okay? And that's kind of a bizarre thing. So when we're thinking about our chemical and physical properties, we've got these changes. Every single one of these changes could represent a chemical change. Every single one of these changes can also represent a physical change. So you have to be very careful in how you classify those pieces to make sure that you're putting it together appropriately. Okay? So, let's take a look. Change in phase. A gas is formed. Give me a case where you think that would be a chemical change. Dry ice. Dry ice. What do you mean dry ice? What am I doing with the dry ice? Uh, we can add water to it. Okay, I add water to it. What happens with the dry ice? Gas. I see a gas. Chemical or physical? Physical, purely physical. Ask for a chemical change. Okay. That one, again, becomes tricky. When you're getting it going from a solid to the gas, you aren't changing the identity of carbon dioxide. You're just changing its phase. How did you get it to change phase? Why did it turn into a gas? What did you do to cause CO2 solid to turn into a gas? You added heat. Okay. You added the energy to cause the phase change. If you're adding the energy, it is typically a physical change. Okay. And we have to throw in that word typically. How do I get a chemical process? Give me a chemical reaction that produces a gas. Vinegar and baking soda. Vinegar and baking soda. I mix vinegar with baking soda it bubbles violently. Okay? What is that bubbling? Okay. It's a gas. It's a CO2 gas coming off of that. Okay? We don't need to know that necessarily to find chemical or physical. Though. We saw a phase change, either from a solid to a gas or a liquid to a gas. Did you provide energy when you mixed the vinegar and the baking soda? No. No. You just put two phases together, or two materials together. What provided the energy to go from the solid or liquid to the gas? The, the chemicals provided that energy. If the chemicals provide the energy, that's a chemical change. Okay? The same thing can happen for solids. Okay? I can take a liquid and I can put it in the freezer. It becomes a solid. That's a phase change. Should that be chemical or physical? Physical. physical. Why? I was the one that removed the energy. That's what happens when I put it in a freezer. The whole point of a freezer is to Freeze. remove energy. That's why it turns into a solid. Okay. What happens if I mix two liquids in a solid forms? Chemical. 
now that's a chemical change. The energy to cause that phase change is being provided by the chemicals, not you. Okay? Color changes become very, very tricky because the color changes are all due to a kind of internal chemical process. Okay? Sometimes that can be a dilution of color. Cake frosting, adding red food dye to white cake frosting is a dilution of color. A dilution of color is not a chemical change. But if I take white cake frosting and a clear liquid, and I now mix them, and it becomes red, where the hell do red come from? A chemical reaction. So like a little lab when you get iodine, you turn purple? And that's oxygen, right? So when we did the lab and we took iodine, what did you do with the iodine? You added heat. So right out of the gate, you should be questioning that as a chemical process because you've added energy to the system. Uh, but then it reacts with oxygen. Okay. Is it reacting with oxygen to turn purple? No. Okay. Have you looked at food dye before? Yeah, what color do all food dyes look like? Black. Until you do what? Dilute the color a little bit. Okay. What color was iodine? Black. When you added heat, you turned a small amount of that solid into a gas. You've now diluted that color a little bit. Now you can see it for what its color is. That's the purple. It's not a chemical reaction. Okay. That one becomes even more challenging because when you remove the heat, if everything works perfectly, and you look at the side of the tube, what you will see is little hairs of iodine. Well, how the hell did the hairs of iodine make it up to the top of the tube? When it became a gas, it was able to rise up and fill the tube. When you cooled it down, it re-solidified and it forms on the side of the glass. That's how the iodine traveled up there. Okay? That effect is very small and difficult to see. That's one of the reasons why chemical changes can be difficult to differentiate from physical, is it's very difficult to see these changes. Okay? The last one's probably, well, probably not the easiest to see, because change in phase is pretty easy, a change in color is pretty easy to see. But the last one is ultimately what's causing all of these, is it's a change in energy. Right? It's just a question of what that energy does. In some cases, the energy is causing a phase change. In some cases, that change in energy is causing a color change. Sometimes it's just a release of energy. Well, if it's releasing energy, how am I going to know? I'll feel it. I have to test it. I have to stick my hand around it and say, well, what's happening? If the reaction releases energy, that energy gets absorbed by my hand, and I feel heat. Okay. Are there other forms of energy? In theory, you read about it in chapter 3. We'll talk about it way maybe at the end of this unit. Okay. What are the other forms of energy that we could see instead of heat that we could see? Light. light is a form of energy. So if you mix two chemicals and you get this massive light that comes off of it, where did the energy come from to make the light? Chemical change. Okay. So there are a variety of ways that we can see each of these things, and it becomes tricky to classify them. Okay? A lot of them become experience-based. Oh, geez, come on. So like melting ice. Okay? We've all melted ice. We should have recognized that we can reverse that, that we've supplied the energy to reverse that. So we should be able to say the melting ice is physical. Okay? Dissolving sugar. We've done it. So we have a familiarity with it. We might say that when we dissolve sugar, okay, we see a change in phase. Is it really a change in phase? No. Actually, the creation of a new phase, we had a pure liquid, a pure solid, and we put them together, and we ended up with a solution, an aqueous solution. Okay? If we use our knowledge of reversibility, could I reverse that yes. by doing what? Applying heat to do what? Boil. Cause the water to boil, goes into a gas, and then the sugar to remain behind as a solid. 
right. If anybody's ever cooked and tried to make caramel, you'll probably reference the reversibility of dissolving sugar to be virtually impossible because that's how we make caramel is it's not reversible. Okay? Because when we add heat, what does the sugar do? It burns. It doesn't melt. Like, really? That caramel taste that you're used to is burned sugar. Okay? Very carefully burned sugar. Because you've probably also tasted things that were fully burned sugar and they tasted awful. Okay? So you have to be very careful with that process. Okay? Dissolving salt becomes a fun one because dissolving salt is almost identical to the process of dissolving sugar. It looks exactly the same. And dissolving salt is even more easily reversible than dissolving sugar. Because when I add heat, what happens to the salt? It stays. Okay? The dissolving of sugar is a physical process. We don't break any chemical bonds. The dissolving of salt, that one's a chemical process. We break the bond between the sodium and the chloride. Okay? How do you know? Mike said. Because you tested it. Okay? And this is interesting. You guys actually tested and proved that the dissolving of sugar is a physical change and the dissolving of salt was chemical. Remember that chemical versus physical lab? We had you take water and what'd you add to it? Salt. And then you added sugar to some different water. And then what did you add to them? Silver nitrate. The silver reacted with the salt didn't react with the sugar. Why is the silver reacting with the salt? Because there's something in there that it can chemically react with. Okay. What charge is silver? A plus one. What did the silver react with? So there's two pieces, sodium or chloride. The sodium is positively charged. Would I expect the sodium to interact with the silver? No. Same charges repel. What's reacting with the silver? Chloride. How do I know it's doing a chemical reaction? When I mix the silver ion with the salt water, what happened? I saw a precipitate. When I added the salt water to it, I, or salt to the water, I didn't see any bonds breaking. But clearly a bond had to break if silver's going to bond to the chlorine. I thereby know the dissolving process of sodium chloride in water is a chemical process because I have direct evidence to support it. What happens with the sugar water? Nothing. There was no chemical process happening, which gives me evidence that the sugar in water was a, chemi was a physical process, not a chemical. Okay. Those are pretty fascinatingly awesome conclusions to be making based off of that experiment. Not to stand on a soapbox or anything. How many of you were drawn to making those conclusions? How many of you were not drawn to making those conclusions? There we go. At least two people were listening. Okay. I was not drawn to that. Why not? I'll give you, I'll, I'll accept two answers and one of them is, is not good. So there's two conclusions on why you are not drawn to salt being a chemical change versus sugar being a physical. So what about that lab did not draw your attention to make those conclusions? That's a nice way to say it didn't ask us. It, according to Greg, vague pronoun. Can't use that. Fix it. What's it? Your instructor did not draw your attention to that conclusion. Okay? My fault. Or, rather, and. The lab itself didn't draw your attention to make that conclusion. You just mixed chemicals, and then were you asked to analyze those results? No. 
AKA bad science. <laughs> Hi. Buy another course. Or just the first step of Ouch. science. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> just the first step of science. By the end of the day, we're going to <laughs> Why did I not draw your attention to it? Because I know the topic is very advanced at that stage in the semester. We don't have the skills to really fully process that. Okay? We're starting to get to that point, which is why. What are we doing? We're now starting to process and talk about it. Okay? So we're going to continue to push on states of matter and equations. When we write out a chemical equation, we need to specify all the phases. What phases are there? Oh, solid. solid, liquid, yeah. gas. Aqueous. We didn't talk about aqueous as a phase. <laughs> solid, liquid, and gas are our standard phases. We also have a fourth phase. Okay, it's not really a phase. For those of you throwing out plasma, that one's a more appropriate phase. What is this fourth phase that's showing on up, showing up up here? Aqueous. Aqueous is not really a phase. It's just a common mixture. Why is aqueous such a common mixture? Because water is virtually everything. We're looking at 70%, 80% of the world as we know it. Almost all of our reactions run in water. So we invented a new phase to represent an aqueous phase. Okay? It's not the same as the other phases because an aqueous, by definition, is a mixture. Okay? Solids, liquids, gases, plasmas, which you can ignore, okay? are pure substances. Okay? What information could be in the equation? So we got phases. What else is in that equation? We could see charge. I would actually push charge to not being in the equation. Where would charge show up? Charge would show up for an individual compound. Okay? So I wouldn't place charge in an equation. It's part of a compound, and a compound would be in the equation. Okay? What could show up, or what else is in that equation? The compounds involved. Are all those compounds the same? No. no. What are they? Reactants and products. How do we know reactants versus products? Side of the arrow. Different sides of the arrow. So the arrow shows us that we have a reaction. What else could we see there? I had reference to a coefficient. We can specify the amount of each of those compounds that are present. Okay? Right? So there's a variety of things that we could drop into a chemical equation. That's what your textbook provides out. You're responsible for being able to interpret that language. On top of the language of symbols, okay, of our individual elements, on top of the language of polyatomic ions, on top of the language of nomenclature, it stacks, right? Okay. So if we have weaknesses early on, we need to fix those weaknesses as soon as possible because they're going to haunt us all the way through this. Okay. So... Some other kind of basic pieces behind this. Conservation of mass. Okay. I cannot create or destroy matter. Okay. That's one of my rules. Okay. It's a physical rule that we haven't been able to disprove in this class. Okay. What does that mean mathematically for us? Because a lot of people go, oh yeah, well, you can't create or destroy matter, but then they don't know how to use it. What would that mathematically mean? What has to equal each other? Reactants and the products, as mass, must be equal to each other. So if I give you one gram of hydrogen and two grams of oxygen, you know you need three grams of water. Okay. What if I gave you four grams of water? How much oxygen did you have? Three. 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 Right? Yeah. Straightforward? No. No. Yeah, they have to be equal. For those people being like, well, but it's not balanced, there's a reason I didn't show symbols and we're using text to describe these. So don't be associating in any kind of extra numerical value beyond this. We're just saying absolute mass has to be equal on both sides. Okay? 
Because really, what you're potentially suggesting opens up a whole other can of worms that we won't see for like four weeks. Okay? So, how about this next one? Two grams of wood, one gram of oxygen, how much gas did I make? Okay. So there's a couple like people jumping right out of the gate and saying, you don't know. Do you really want to listen to those guys? Probably not. Probably not. Okay, switch it up. What's the mass of the gas? At least or not exceeding. Okay. There's. Okay. It has to be less than or equal to three grams. Does everybody agree with that statement? Yes, why? Could it be equal to if there's no water? There's only three grams to start with. Okay. And then we just had someone that ventured out there and said, well, could it actually be three grams of gas? There's also water. So if it came as three grams of gas, how much water did I produce? Zero. Which means the equation would be wrong. Which means it can't be less than or equal to... Whoa, there's some letters under there. It just has to be less than three grams. There was a suggestion that it has to be greater than one. Could I have produced 0 0.5 grams of gas and two and a half grams of water? So, and this is where we have to be careful. We don't necessarily know that from our equation, okay? The interpretation that you want to throw on there is how much each of those things weigh. Does a chemical equation tell you anything about weight? Okay. To give you an idea, I want to make a sandwich, right? How do we make a sandwich? Basic recipe for a sandwich. Tell me. Bread in a thing. Bread in a thing. I'll accept that. Bread in a thing. If I give you two slices of bread and one thing, how many sandwiches can you make? One. One. Basic, basic sandwich, right? 500 grams of bread. And one thing. How, how much... How many sandwiches can you make? A slice of bread weighs 500 grams. Okay. Our recipe doesn't specify the mass when we think about our overall recipes on how we build things. It's a counting process. When we look at a chemical equation, it's a counting process. It's the number of those pieces, not the mass of those pieces. Right? You might say, well, but recipes all involve mass. To build a bicycle, describe how to build a bicycle. You just counted a bunch of pieces. What is the mass of those pieces? You don't know. Okay? So you can make parallels to cooking and say, well, cooking, you use cups and masses and grams and all that. That's true. We had to invent a system when doing a recipe to make it easily replicable. Okay? When we move to chemistry or most equations that we work with, we aren't looking at masses of them because it's harder to do that. Why is it harder to do that? The recipe said find 500 grams of flour. Why is that harder than saying take one scoop of flour? I have to weigh it, which requires an instrument. That instrument adds a step to it, which makes it more difficult to do. So if you look at recipes, they're mostly based off of scoops. Yes, the scoops are a little bit more precise than scoop. We go with cup, half cup, okay? They're a measurement device. Those are pretty easy to get a hold of. How many of you have a balance in your house to do your baking? Very few people. You know the people that have a balance? Bakers. Bakers. Why? It's more consistent in making their final product. Okay? The scoop isn't consistent enough. Okay? So when we go through and look behind these, these are amounts, okay? counting effects of our equations. They're not masses. 
We can give you masses and tell, have you tell me what's remaining. What should that last piece be? <coughs> but to know that, you have to know all but one of your entries. So the initial question that I asked, how much gas was made? You can't answer it until I do what? Tell you that water was 2.5 grams. Now you know the gas was half a gram. Make sense? Sure. Sure, sarcastic or sure, yep, you're on the same page? Sure. Yes. Exactly. Okay, it all comes down to the amount of knowns versus unknowns you've got. Okay? So during a chemical change, some things happen. Proust went through and observed, don't worry about scientists' names, came up with this thing called the law of definite composition. So compounds always contain the same elements in a constant proportion by mass, which means when I look at water, what is the mass of hydrogen in water? I said the mass of hydrogen. Okay, so we're hearing two to one. Two to one what? <coughs> two what to one what? Two oxygen, one hydrogen. No, okay, what do you think it is? Two hydrogen, one oxygen. So this is mass. This is mass. Both of those are wrong. The mass of a hydrogen atom is one. How many hydrogens are in water? Two. 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 So our hydrogen is two H. I'll absolutely give you that. What's the mass of the one oxygen? One oxygen is 16. So your ratio is two to 16. And for those of you being like, damn, that would make things really confusing. Yeah, because when we think about water, what do we think about? H2O. When we look at H2O, what are those numbers representing? So we're hearing a ratio. Ratios work, but a ratio of what? The number of those elements. Because it's not the mass. Okay? So... Proust based it off of mass. Why? Because he couldn't look at atomic level. Why could he not look at atomic level? There's a reason that's a hand-drawn picture of him. Okay? This is really old. 1800s. Okay? So they did it based off of mass, because that was the only thing they could measure. They couldn't measure the amount of atoms present. Okay? It turns out that that mass ratio will relate back to the counting ratio, but you have to be very careful with how you make that assessment. Okay? How do we measure this? This is just kind of random stuff, because I think about this, like, how do you measure that mass? You took two grams of hydrogen, how'd you do that? And 16 grams of oxygen, how the hell did you do that? Like, how are you mixing these things to get these ratios? There are ways to go through and do it. They're very particular reactions. So, for instance, doing water is not an easy one. Why would water be a difficult reaction to look at? You have to separate the I need hydrogen and I need oxygen. Why is that a difficult reaction? Explosive. They are Burning. explosive. Burning. Periodic table gives you a big hint. They're gases. To be able to measure these, I have to measure out each substance. How do I pour a gas onto a balance? You don't. It becomes a very tricky thing to measure. So when we're talking about these experiments, they're talking about running experiments with solids. Potassium chlorate is a solid. Right? And it decomposes into these two compounds. We can see that constant mass ratio because what will happen at the end? What is the O2? It's a gas. It leaves the system. So we can 
take varying amounts of potassium chlorate and I can look at a ratio by mass to see that there was a constant proportion of oxygen in there. Okay? That's kind of neat. Okay? It can be done with a variety of other methods, but that's ultimately experimentally where it's coming from. I only talk about that because I think it's neat. Okay? Dalton comes along, takes a look at the constant proportions, and then goes through and says, dude, when I built that bicycle, I didn't weigh out the wheels. This is a stupid relationship. It has to boil down to individual atoms. So now when I talk about building things, I'm going to talk about taking atom A, atom B, and I put them together to make a compound. So he's now changing how we manipulate and think about these processes. Why is that extra cool? Do we have atoms yet? No, the atoms are still insanely tiny particles that Dalton can't physically hold. He's just predicting that they must be there. Why does he think they must be there? When you build a table, what do you use? A tabletop and four legs, right? Individual pieces go into making a table. If I'm talking about looking at that atomically, that's all he's saying is we're taking, I'm building a table, I'm just going to shrink it down and say that that's how atoms get built. Why? Well, it works at the macro scale. Why not at the atomic scale? Okay. Was it a perfect assessment? No. Which of those five principles failed? One, why? Why is one a failure? An element, is An element is divisible based off of what evidence? We have electrons. How do we know we have electrons? Thomas. Thompson. Thompson with the cathode ray tube. Okay. That was our first hint. Two, or that totally gave things away, but let's just do it. Which other rule is, is not valid anymore? Wow, two, amazing. <laughs> Why is it not true? That's not true. Different protons, does that change? Because we say all atoms of an element are identical. If I take two atoms of an element and I change one of the protons, one of their protons, is that the same element? No. No. So changing the protons does not invalidate rule two. I could change the amount of electrons. Now the charge is different. Is it still sodium? Yep. Yeah. Do I get a difference in chemistry there? You eat sodium metal, you're dead. You eat sodium ions, you live. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's a pretty big difference, <laughs> all based off of an electron. Okay. So yes, atoms are different for an individual element because we can change the number of electrons. We could also change the number of neutrons. And then we would have isotopes, yes. Okay. So two is invalidated based off of ionic compounds and based off of isotopes. Right? The rest of them hold true, and they're ultimately just boiling down to we now have these pieces. Okay? So let's look at a chemical reaction. Let's put some pieces together. So here's a chemical reaction. Solid sodium hydride reacts with acetic acid to produce aqueous sodium acetate and hydrogen gas. Obvious, right? That's just English, guys. Okay. I mean, what's the big deal? Does anybody look at that and go, that's like, I'm not quite sure what's going on with that? Could I change the organization of this so that I could better understand what's happening with it? Like, what are the reactants? What are the products? So, sodium hydride. You're repeating sodium hydride. What does that mean? That's still just written. Someone. I could go through and say NaH because sodium is Na, hydride is H. Is that a reactant or a product? We'd use the language of that to describe that it was a reactant. 
If I'm going to write out a chemical equation, I can very quickly show that it's a reactant by doing what? Making sure that the sodium hydride is to the left of the arrow. Did I include all of the information that was in the English language? Yes. Not yet. No. Not solid. yet. It said it was a solid. Okay. Continue. Acetic acid is also a reactant. It says reacts with. What is the reacts with language-wise? Plus. Plus, or symbolically, whatever it is. Greg, can you help me with that? Reacts with? Plus sign reaction. Is a plus sign? Yeah. What's that translation? Symbolic. Symbolic? Sure. That's an option. Okay. That seems additive. I would almost want to say multiplication, but that would throw No. Acetic acid. I'm just going to keep going. Acetic acid. Wait, we were supposed to memorize that one, right? Yeah. You were supposed to memorize how that derives into a formula. Yes, you're not supposed to memorize the formula of acetic acid. You want to, you can, but that's, I'm not asking you to do that. It says acid. What does it mean when it says acid? We know we have an H and we know it ends with AQ. Okay. We might laugh at that and be like, well, that's dumb. That probably eliminated one of your multiple choice answers. You went from 20% success to now 25. Good on you. That's pretty decent. Okay, now what? I ate a little much. I think I'm getting sick. The ick comes from eight, meaning this is acetate. C2H3O2 or something like that. Yes, that is the acetate ion. Okay. I have to know the language cues to be able to build it in. Okay. To produce. Actually, I retract that. How do I know it was aqueous? It doesn't say aqueous. Acid. By saying acid, it implies the aqueous. Very borderline statement, but that's how this class is going to run. Solid acids. Very borderline statement, but that's how this class is going to run. <laughs> to produce, we've got that with our arrow. Aqueous sodium acetate. Na. Na. C2H3O2 AQ plus because and hydrogen gas H and then we heard a G. Okay, so let's address some of this. Touche H parentheses, we have to drop the parentheses on that. You're right, because otherwise it could be confused with mercury. Okay. All we've gone through and done is directly translate these things down. We haven't officially addressed, did we translate them fully correctly? What do I mean by fully correctly? We have to make sure that each of those formulas was correctly balanced. What is the charge on sodium? What is the charge on hydride? It's also a minus one. Hydrogen ion is a plus one. Hydride flips the other direction, becomes a minus one. Is the formula sodium hydride correct? Yes, yes the charges balance out. Charge on hydrogen. I said hydrogen, plus one. Charge on acetate, negative one. How do you know acetate was a negative one? You have to memorize it. Okay? About a third to half of the class watched the nomenclature video. The other half of the class might be like, how did you do that? Because it's in the video that you're supposed to watch that tells you you need to memorize it. You should watch the video. <coughs> Today is going to be a very painful lab for you. Very painful. Yeah. You're going to have... Glorious 5, 10 o'clock staying the whole time to prove to me you know nomenclature. Okay? 
So there we go. Is that formula correct? Yes. 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 Sodium with acetate. Charge on sodium. Plus one. Plus one and? Minus one. Minus one. That one's correct. Should I be looking at charge for this one? Why not? No, no, no. <laughs> Your answers are false. Is the rest of the equation really balanced? No. Why did we have to evaluate the charge on all the other ones? Because the charge has to balance on both sides of the earth. Not because they were compounds. Because they were something compounds. Ionic. ionic compounds. Because they were ionic compounds or acids which fall in the ionic category, we have to balance charges. Why, when I look at hydrogen, do I ignore at the end a charge? Because it's not an ionic compound. To be an ionic compound, what would I need to have? A metal. I don't have a metal there. Okay. This is going to be a very difficult problem to go through and balance. Okay. So for those of you that read the, or watched the play posit or looked at balancing in the textbook, this is going to be an exceptionally difficult one to balance because we're missing a very big piece of key information. That last formula is wrong. It has to be H2 gas. Why? Hydrogen has to have two. When we're looking at hydrogen in its elemental state, we will never see it by itself. What's the term for that? Okay, it has to have two atoms. Diatomic. There are certain elements that are diatomic in their natural states. Hydrogen is one of them. We'll talk about the others in maybe the very next aspect on this. Okay, what's that? So tin, um, tin. No, not tin. Don't start throwing them out yet. Okay, because, yeah, it's about to show up here. So we could look at our nice equation. We could go through and attempt to balance it. What are we talking about when we want to balance it? Charge. Okay, we could try and look at charge. Arguably, charge is the hardest thing to look at because our charge comes from... Electrons. Anybody see the symbol for electrons in our equation? No. So it's going to be very difficult to balance electrons if we don't see them. Okay. Conservation of mass. We need to make sure the masses add up on both sides. Okay. It doesn't explicitly say the mass, but do I know the mass on a sodium atom? Yeah, what is the mass for a sodium atom? For those of you doing sig figs, good on you. I'm going to write 23. What is the mass of the sodium on the product side? 20, oof. Let's try that again. 23. What is the mass of hydrogen on the reactant side? For those of you taking notes, hold your horses. What's that? How many hydrogens are there? So there's one, well, there's one, there's three. So the mass of hydrogen is five. How much is it on the other side? There's three, there's two, right? So there's five, right? This, this is looking like an awful lot of math, right? What's that? Okay. If you've done the equation right, what does the equation show you? The number of those particles. Okay. So we can take advantage of Dalton and Proust to go through and say, all I have to do is count the number of the element. As long as the number of the element's the same, the mass will be the same. So how do I change up that work? How many sodiums do I have on the left? One. On the right. One. How many hydrogens on the left? Five. How many hydrogens on the right? Five. 
Carbon's on the left. Right? Oxygen's? And? Two. What does that mean? It's balanced. It's balanced. That's nice. And a bit mean, because I gave you one that was already balanced. We didn't have to do anything to it. It is now perfectly balanced. We're done. That is now a valid chemical equation for us. Okay? This is all. Yeah. Okay. Hydrogen. Diatomic. Okay. There are certain elements that you will have to memorize that are diatomic. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. There are a variety of ways to memorize these seven diatomic elements. The one that I memorized was have no fear of ice cold beer. When did I memorize that? High school. Okay. Some things just stick. Okay. There are very few mnemonic devices that I've ever memorized. This is one that I know of off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, there's a weird... If you talk to the tutoring center, they have one on camels in Phoenix. Eating clams or something like that. Um, the, yeah, I don't get it either, but it works. It's really neat. Okay. So just the first letter pairs out. Okay, so that's the one I remember. There's another one. Okay, how many are there? How many? There's seven, right? So we had nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. What shape does that look like? Oh, it's seven. How many did I circle? Seven. Six. Six. There's the seven. I forgot. One. Okay. What other shapes does this look like? Oh, yeah? No, I wasn't going with a gun. A what? A hockey stick and a puck. Hi. If, if you want to... That's the first time I've actually even noticed a gun. So, wow. Yeah, that is the head for Can I move seats? Okay. <laughs> um, so you're welcome any way that you want to memorize it that's fine that's fine okay but you need to know that when you see oxygen by itself it's O2 okay so when I say oxygen gas the symbol for oxygen gas is O2 when I say fluorine gas the symbol is yeah because I said fluorine sorry I thought I said something else I thought they said something else. What if I want to refer to just a single atom of chlorine in the gas state? How do I reference that? Because if I say chlorine gas, what does that mean? Cl2. How do I reference a single atom of chlorine in the gas state? What am I referencing? Yeah, exactly. If we wind back like 10 seconds in the video, what did I say? How do I reference a single atom of chlorine in the gas state? Single atom is not Cl2. <laughs> For those of you really like struggling with that, I literally just said the answer. How do I reference a single atom of chlorine in the gas state? single atom of chlorine in the gas state. That's how I have to reference it. I have to use all of that sequence of words. I can't just say chlorine. I have to say a single atom of chlorine in the gas state. Okay. Yeah. That's because we don't do it very often. Okay. How would we write it symbolically? CL, G, yeah, there we go. And what would that symbol mean? A single atom of chlorine in the gas state. Fantastic, there were that, okay? So it has to be very explicitly referencing a single atom. If you don't see it reference an atom of chlorine, it's CL2, okay? That will come back in unit three, just for reference. 
Nope, because there's no charge. Okay. So balancing has to be the same on both sides of the equation. This was all review. We just walked through it. Okay. What we can potentially introduce is coefficients. Okay. So those are multiples of all of the subscripts in that chemical formula. So if I write 3H2O, that means how many water molecules do I have? Three. Three. How many hydrogen atoms are there? Six. How many oxygen? Three. Okay. So the coefficient is a, come on, catch up, is a multiplier on whatever comes after it. A subscript is a multiplier on whatever comes immediately before it, in this case, the hydrogen, right? I'm sorry, can you A subscript is a multiplier on what immediately comes in front of it. A coefficient is a multiplier on what comes after it. After it, up to what? up to some kind of differentiator. That, what could that differentiator be? Uh, a space. The smallest unit of meaning in this case would be a space that allows us to differentiate that we're no longer referring to water, we're referring to a different compound. Typically in a chemical equation, what's gonna follow that space that's a larger red flag? A plus sign or an arrow. But a space is technically the morpheme that we're looking at there. Okay, so let's pick another one. Let's take a look at calcium hydroxide. Uh, and let's do four calcium hydroxide. How many calciums are there? Four. four. How many hydroxides are there? It's eight. Why? What is hydroxide? O H. But there's four, right? The two refer refers to what is directly in front of it. What is directly in front of it? The parenthesis is what is directly in front of it. Which means that two applies both to the H and the oxygen. It applies to that whole piece. It does not apply to the calcium. Kind of, sort of? So it would be O2H2. Like if you, I, so, you that yes, I understand where you're going with that. So let's, I'm going to drop that four because I and all those letters. <laughs> so what was just suggested is that this could be written out CaO2H2. What do you guys think? This gets back to what we talked about when we looked at chemical formulas. Okay? The chemical formula can get written in a variety of different ways. Okay? The way that we want to pick holds the most meaning. If I asked you to name CaO2H2, you'd probably be able to tell me the calcium. Would you be able to tell me what the other one was? No. So by writing it out in that fashion, it is technically a correct formula. But what have you done? It's not that it's not hydroxide. We don't know that it's hydroxide. We've removed information by doing that multiplying out. So that is not something that you should be doing. You should be writing it as CaOH. There's our hydroxide. How many hydroxides do I need to balance the calcium? Two. That's why the two is there, right? Did I really need two to balance the calcium? Okay, we're getting a mixed response, that's okay. How do we address it? We find out. How, yes. I would need to look up the charge on the hydroxide. We're looking it up because we didn't memorize it. Were you told to memorize it? Yes. I did say that, right? Yes. yes, you were told to memorize it, so you should memorize it because it is gonna show up. How about calcium? I appreciate that. <laughs> plus two. Calcium is a plus two. How do you know calcium is a plus two? Okay. We could do a couple ways with the calcium. You could say, I was told to memorize that calcium was a plus two. Okay. You could say that calcium is in group two, and I memorized that all group two is a plus two. 
You could say that I memorized that calcium wants to become like a noble gas. The easiest way to get to the noble gas is for it to lose two electrons, thereby it's a plus two. Okay. All of those are valid ways to interpret it. Okay. When you go through to solve a question, you should be acknowledging why you think that information. So that when you go back to study, you know why you wrote that. Not just you pulled it out of nothing. I would actually argue if you don't write down where you got that information, your chemistry notes look beautiful. <laughs> Useless, but beautiful. <laughs> okay? You need to know where the information is coming from. And that can be tricky because just that calcium ion, we've now talked about multiple times and multiple different ways to get that information. You have to be able to dredge that information back up. Okay? Remember recall versus recognition? You might recognize that calcium is a plus two, but recalling it is a whole nother thing. You need to have that note for how you're recalling that information to ensure you can get it right. Make sense? Okay. Process for balancing chemical equations. Okay. I break it down into seven distinct steps. Okay. Step one, you might need to predict the products. Did we have to do that for the last one? No, we were just translating the English text down for us, okay? But you might have to, okay? You should balance your formulas. We did check that. We went through and said sodium hydride. Sodium was a plus one. Hydride was a minus one. I need one of each. You have to balance each formula before you balance the equation. If not, you're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> Begin to balance, thank you. <laughs> Begin to balance the equation by starting with any atom. Pick any atom you want and start balancing. But don't pick hydrogen or oxygen. Okay? Why not pick hydrogen and oxygen? It's not so much that there are exceptions. Hydrogen and oxygen typically show up in a lot of different places. If you're trying to balance things on both sides of the equation, but you've got two different choices on things that you could change, that's going to become more difficult for you to balance. So what you're trying to do with that picking an element to start with is pick an element that only shows up once on each side of the equation. Hydrogen and oxygen very typically show up multiple times on both sides of the equations. Okay? You'll place whole numbers in front of the formulas. That's our coefficient to balance. What you will not do is change the formula. Why not? Because rule number two, you already fixed the formula. Okay? Once you start balancing the equation, your formulas had better be correct. Okay? If you decide that, whoops, my formula was wrong, you restart the whole process. Don't start to be, well, I just won't worry about it, because it will screw you over. Okay? Then you repeat steps three and four with a new atom until you verified each atom. Okay? Then you get to check your work by repeating steps three through five. Okay? How many times should you repeat it? I think I said it in the video. Did I say it in the video? You said if you no. did it like up to like six or seven times. Okay. So I did it nicely in the video. I'm not a nice person. You need to repeat it so many times that you're starting to question why you're taking this class from me. <laughs> because I am forcing you to check your work that much. What I'm trying to build is that little bit of anger. Just a little bit. <laughs> okay, why? It's an emotional tie that will help you remember the process. Okay? If I can build just a little bit of anger behind that, you consistently do this right, and you don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about taking points away. Okay? If you're starting to get, like, really angry... Stop. <laughs> you don't need to check anymore. Okay. The nice reference is that you should go through and check until you stop changing numbers. Anytime you change a coefficient, you need to check. Anytime. Okay. This can become a problem in where people start to get angry. Okay. The checking the work means it all balances out and you aren't changing numbers. 
If you're looping through and you're constantly changing numbers and changing numbers and changing numbers, guess what happened? You did step two wrong. Okay? Go back and check your formulas. Okay? That's actually a nice thing because there are ways that you could screw up step two and balance the equation. You'd get the wrong answer because your formulas were incorrect. Or but your formulas would be incorrect. Okay. The last thing, which if you've done everything nicely and beautifully, is verify you have the smallest whole number possible. Okay. You you kind of don't have to do that if, you don't. if you've done everything right, you shouldn't have to verify that. But the verify should be pretty simple. Because okay? what you'd be doing is looking at your coefficients. Okay. If I got 2, 1, 3, 6. Okay. Is that the smallest number I could possibly do all the way through? Yeah. If I try to go any smaller than one, what happens? I get less than a molecule. I'm not allowed to do that. Okay? So those are now the smallest possible numbers I could get through. What if I went through and balanced and I got something like this? 2, 2, 6. Nope, I'm not necessarily missing two of something on the other side. This whole equation could be reduced. It could be reduced to become one, one, whoa, sorry, I was supposed to slide, three. Okay? So all you're doing is looking at those coefficients and deciding do you have the smallest possible sequence of numbers? Okay, make sense? Yes. Yeah, if you have an odd number, you can't go lower. Yeah, it would be balanced. Okay. I believe the stars are on ones that you didn't do in the video or weren't required to do in the video. No, you made it the Yeah, you're like these these three are easy, but do the hard one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like about me. Okay. So, does anybody want me to do the second one? Yes. Okay, we'll do the second one and we'll do the. Actually, we'll do all three of those. Okay. So, process behind this. Okay. You need a consistent process. There are a variety of ways to do this. The process that I pick is I start with my reaction arrow. And I go directly underneath that and I write my first element. What element do you think I'm going to pick? Why bromine? It's not H or O. Does it matter in this case? No. Hydrogen shows up once on both sides of the equation. Bromine shows up once on both sides of the equation. It doesn't matter what I pick. Good practice. Do not hydrogen and oxygen first. So, bromine. How many bromines do I have on the left? How many bromines do I have on the right? One. That's not balanced. Okay. I just want to address it because I've watched some people go through and do work and they'll now do hydrogen. It wasn't balanced. Fix it. You found a problem. Fix the problem before you continue forwards. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it, it can be problematic. Okay. So how do I fix it? How do I make sure that I get two bromines on both sides of these equations? I need the two to multiply backwards. I can't put in a subscript because if I put in a subscript, I'm changing the formula. I'm not allowed to do that. So I put a two there, which means how many bromines do I have on the right? Two. Now I'll continue on. Hydrogen. How many hydrogens on the left? How many hydrogens on the right? Two. So that would suggest it's balanced. What do we do now? How many bromines do I have on the left? Two. Bromines on the right. Two. Hydrogens on the left. Two. Hydrogens on the right. Two. What do I do now? Check the <laughs> Hydrogens on the right. Two. Two. Yeah. 
Because this is an interesting thing. You're like, well, you started with hydrogen now. If you've balanced it, does it matter the order you go in? No. Nope. For sure in our work, when we have things like this, do you want us to write it seven times? No, no, God, no, don't do that, don't do that. Yeah. All I want to see is that work that I had initially erased, which I... Where you cross out the one on the erase seven times the rest of the paper. I'm trying to... There it is. That's the work that I would expect to see. Okay, admittedly, could somebody in this classroom do that in their head? Yes. Yes. That's a lot of extra busy work to make you go through and do. I would argue balancing a chemical equation is not show your work. I'd put it in the multiple choice. Okay. Okay. What questions could I ask about this? And we're like dead on time, so this is the only one we'll do today. Sum of the I could ask for the sum of the coefficients. You'll get one, you'll get two, you'll get three, four, and because of Starting a pattern, I'll drop in five. Why one? What's the coefficient in front of hydrogen? One. Why two? So hydrogen there, or the sum of those two. Why three? Because if you didn't balance this, one plus one plus one is three. Why four? That was the right answer. Why five? I ran out of choices and just made one up. Okay. What's the coefficient on HBr? What are my answer choices? The answer choices are now all exactly the same. But the answer becomes... So you need to read balancing equation questions very carefully to make sure you're answering the question that's asked. Okay? The most common way to ask is the sum of the coefficients. Sometimes you'll see reference into individual pieces. Okay? With that, I've got to stop, but I think Greg's got something to add. 30 seconds. I have